Welcome to the Living in Alignment podcast. My name is Amy Landry. Through a collage of conversations, here we distill mindful living and timeless wisdom within a modern, everyday context. Thank you for being here. Laura Poole is a Vedic meditation teacher and founder of Maha Soma supporting Vedic meditators and teachers with feminine-led Vedic wisdom, embodiment practices, and community. Laura has trained intensively over the past 15 years with great masters in Australia and India. She currently resides in Noosa, Australia, on her three-acre homestead, growing a syntropic food forest and biodynamic vegetable garden. Laura shares the transformative wisdom of Vedic meditation, Vedanta, and Ayurveda, in an engaging, relevant, and humorous way that allows people to make deep discoveries about themselves and their purpose. She is a dedicated leader in the meditation space, passionate about community and aware of its transformative power. Laura brings people together in uplifting, shared experiences through Vedic meditation courses, events, and India retreats. Her intention is to share simple how-to techniques for creating awakening, balance and harmony while supporting people to live a heart-based life in flow with nature. Laura was also an original co-founder and co-creator of One Giant Mind Australia and its free Learn to Meditate app. To learn Vedic meditation with Laura, you can head to the website laurapool.com. That's P-O-O-L-E. Laura, I'm so happy we are chatting today and we are therefore able to bring more of your experience and wisdom to the the wider community, particularly as it pertains both to the path and practices of meditation, but also insight into into your work. So welcome. Thank you. Good to be here. (laughs) Yes, absolutely. I'm glad we could time it. So let's, let's start by delving into your personal story and a bit of your timeline, thereby how you came to Vedic meditation um, and have gone on to create such a dedicated community of meditators? Mm. So I didn't come to meditation, you know, for meditation itself. Um, Like a lot of people who come and learn with me now, it seems to be that it's like maybe even the last resort in their health journey usually has to do with health Mm -hmm. but our physical health and mental health of course is um, very much wrapped up in how we process and digest daily life and how much stress pressure strain we're under so um, it really was I would say stress that brought me to meditation and it was my chiropractor. Hmm. He was also an NET kinesiologist and was part of a collective where there was naturopathy and I think there was a few other modalities that that they practiced as well. So it was very much a place of holistic healing and I was engaging in all these other modalities and it was from about age 17. I would say, um, that I started doing this after feeling like there was just something not right, something not right going on, Um, fatigue, um, anxiety, overwhelm, panic attacks, and then just a real heaviness, which was never really diagnosed um, by the doctor as depression or or even had the anxiety. diagnosed these were more experiences that were happening inside and I think back then I can say that now back then in (laughs) those days um, there was less of a conversation taking place around mental health Um, it was just kind of what people experienced Um, Mm -hmm. so I was introduced to Vedic meditation um, by my Cairo who basically said you know we're doing so much good work here you're coming and seeing me twice a week. We've healed so much. You're you're realizing so much about the impact of stress, how to process it and digest it, how these past memories, these past experiences that you've had 
are still very much influencing your present state. And we're doing a lot of revealing of that through the kinesiology. But he also said, you can't keep seeing me twice a week for the rest of your life. Yeah. He's like, first of all, your mum's going to run out of money because at this point my mum was funding this <laughs> whole thing. And he's like, you also have to be doing something for yourself every day because life happens every single day. And if you're not engaging in practices or learning techniques that then allows your nervous system to actually be able to process and digest daily life, then it's going to keep building up, building up, building up, and you'll just keep getting back to the same place that you then go and see someone for to help you resolve it. And then you don't do anything about it and then you're back again. So um, he was really encouraging me to um, take responsibility in many ways for my own mental and physical health. And so, you know, at this point, anything he said to do, I would have gone, yes, sure, let's go for it. Um So I learned meditation and it happened to be Vedic meditation. Now, I didn't know at that point, I was um, 20 at this this stage. I didn't know that there were other forms of meditation. I just thought meditation was meditation. Mm. This is before the days of uh, yoga studios on every street and Instagram and all of that. It was, uh, you know, a kind of odd thing like no one else I didn't know anyone else meditating um and so I just thought everyone did this everyone does Vedic meditation and it's just meditation and it wasn't until years later that I discovered oh there are many other techniques out there many other ways to do this Mm -hmm. and I actually feel so grateful that I found Vedic meditation first because it was so effortless and I experienced shifts in my mind body almost immediately. And the knowledge, the wisdom tradition from which it comes um, and what I received by going to weekly group meditation and and Q&As, like that, I was just so hungry for. And I would sit down, share experiences. Everyone else would share what was going on. Someone would ask a question and then my teacher would reply with the wisdom of the Veda And it was like nectar coming in, soothing balm. And it it wasn't something new per se. It felt very familiar actually. Mm. And it was like a, mm, it was enlivening something within me. And I just got hooked and I was like, yep, I'm in, I'm (laughs) in for life for this. (laughs) There's evidently such an incredible community too. And, and uh, something I I see about Vedic meditation is there's a real respect of the tradition so much so that these techniques are closely guarded in in Mm. some way. And I don't mean to Mm. sound in a really like rigid gatekeeping kind of way, but in a way that you're holding the sacred, if that makes sense. hundred percent. I speak a bit about this because in the West, we are less familiar with the process of initiation Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And we kind of just expect everything to be available to us 24 hours a day, no matter where we're at. Um, But the way in which this knowledge and wisdom technique and practice as well has traditionally been passed down is through a teacher-student relationship and through a process of initiation, which isn't to um, restrict you or bind you in any way, like you're saying, it's actually to help liberate you. Mm -hmm. It's so that your teacher knows, okay, you're ready for this next phase and this next stage because uh, these practices are incredibly powerful and too much too soon can blow your nervous system apart. And although we want to get rid of the stress and, you know, purify, cleanse, liberate, all of that, we also want to live a good life in this human body. And to do that, it requires step by step, you know, slow. In in many ways, it is slow. And again, in this modern day, we want everything now. We want the full thing all at once right now. (laughs) And, you know, I think we can learn a lot from the traditional way of passing down knowledge and wisdom, um, which comes through this process of 
um, initiation, which which means I've integrated, I've practiced, I'm devoted to this. Um, my nervous system, my consciousness state is shifting and changing. Okay, now I'm ready for this next step because I've integrated phase one. And now I'm actually prepared for phase two to receive all the benefits from it um, rather than feeling really unstable, uh, overwhelmed, uh, and like my life's falling apart. And if you kind of look at some of the uh, other spiritual circles that exist within the West, there's a lot of people who who are feeling like that. It's almost like you've you've well, the Vedic meditation community has ensured that it hasn't become another commodity, another thing just to add into your tool belt, another thing, another certificate or something that you can say that you've done and on to the next thing. It's about making sure that the vessel of the body, the vessel of the mind is ready and that that seeker is committed. Mm. That is most definitely my intention as a teacher. And, um, you know, uh, there are so many different teachers of this practice and maybe you will encounter someone who has possibly um, commodified what it mm -hmm. is that they have learned. So, you know, when we talk about Vedic meditation, although it is this in many ways global community, of people who are practicing this this wonderful technique, um, the teachers who share it are independent teachers. Sure. And so you will find teachers who, yes, exactly as you said, um, that's that's why they do what they do. Uh, but we also live in um, we live in a world where everything gets commodified. You know, if I could teach for free. I 100% would hmm. like that would actually be so much easier than having to navigate this whole world of business. To be <laughs> quite honest, I just want to practice myself, <laughs> teach and share this with the world. And mm -hmm. voila, I mean, I was thinking the other day, I was like, who could I get to sponsor me? Like, you know, maybe like a year's worth, like who wants to invest? You sponsor me for a year so I can pay my rent and my food and, you know, put some stuff away for future generations for my children, et cetera, like do that. And then I'm happy to go anywhere. I'd be happy to teach anyone anywhere offered as what we call saver or selfless service. Um, and let's just get people meditating. Mm. I, I, I can sometimes have these, uh, I don't even know what you would call it. I guess a bit more of a radical vision of how we could be doing things. Yeah. Um, but but as I was saying, we do still live in a world in which we've got bills and we have families and mm -hmm, mm -hmm. we're householders. So, you know, that balance can get challenging as a teacher. But I think that integrity of a teacher, you know, in their heart, like ultimately, if it was all possible, what would you be doing? Um, yeah. And to clarify too, I wasn't necessarily implying that you know, when I mentioned commodifying, I wasn't implying that, you know, just money in itself, earning for your work is mm. is wrong. I, I mean, mm. there's an exchange of wealth and there's teachings on wealth from the Vedas and, you know, wealth and prosperity is, is important. But I mean more like making it a trend, making it a new, you know, thing just to do for the sake yeah. of doing it. So you can claim that you have some qualification to then go and teach it to others for the sake of it. So it's a different... Um, the the under underlying intention is different. Yes, yes, we are part of a tradition, and um, we are almost like uh, hmm, trying to think of a word for it. Like we're 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 part of a lineage, you know. We are passing this on like a torchbearer in some way, keeping that light alive and passing totally. it on to, to the next generation. So yes, when you come and learn with us, there is a traditional ceremony that we perform. That ceremony is in Sanskrit. There are offerings that are made of fruit and flowers, and there is deep meaning and deep feeling to it. And it really, in that first session, creates such a fertile ground for you to then be able to receive your mantra and learn this technique. Now, you can learn Vedic meditation and um, not engage in any of the Vedic knowledge or tradition. You don't have to chant mantra. You don't have to engage in any of that 
more cultural aspect of it because it works on its own. Mm. It really does. But I have found that when it is held within the fullness of the culture from which it comes, there's a much um, deeper and richer um, experience that emerges. Mm -hmm. Oh, there's evidently a reverence there for sure, which probably in some sense promotes a far deeper loyalty as well to the practice. And so um, Mm. you've kind of given a little bit of, you've alluded to a little here, but let's lay some further foundation. And I'd love to dive into meditation specifically, kind of Mm. as you were sharing your story, like I just thought there was just meditation, you know, what (laughs) is Vedic meditation specifically? Where does it come from? So can you give us a little bit of maybe history, context, but also layer in um, the practice or the process of Mm. coming into Vedic meditation? Mm. So Vedic meditation it has had many names in the past, and the current name that it has, Vedic meditation, uh, Vedic comes from the word Veda. Veda essentially means knowledge or wisdom or to know. It's the knowingness of life itself. Um, and the reason why we use that word to describe what it is that we do is that this practice and the wisdom that we teach that comes along with it comes from the Veda. So Vedic meditation, Vedic is a very general term. There's Mm. lots that you could say is Vedic. So it can be really challenging when we go, oh, this is Vedic meditation. Um, Prior to it being called Vedic meditation, there were many other names for it. The first name it was given, I believe, was deep meditation. And deep meditation because it's a transcendental practice and transcending um, kind of, I always laugh because I'm like, transcendence is, as it says, you know, it's quite transcendental for people. They're like, what actually is it? What is transcending? What is this thing about? And so a transcendental practice is about going beyond. To transcend means to let go or to go beyond and to make contact with that which is beyond the thinking mind and for most people it's not a common experience to be transcending on a daily basis even though transcendence is a very natural thing right and we would have all tasted it at some point in our life um, when we fall asleep at night we pass through that transcendental field where we're not thinking anymore we're not awake but we're not quite asleep and we slip into this really nice, yummy, juicy, and maybe it's just a second or maybe it's a few minutes if you're able to hold it and then you're off into your sleep Mm -hmm. state. So when you learn this practice, um, as I said, when I first learned, it felt very familiar. It's not something that you have to try to do. There's no focus or concentration. It's about- Yeah, yeah. And it's about relearning how to let go, which is a fascinating concept in itself. You know, letting go, relaxing, you would think it would be quite easy to do. But when you've practiced the opposite for God knows how many years or lifetimes, uh, we have these habits or these tendencies and we do need to um, relearn how to do this. And the technique that we teach within Vedic meditation um, gives you that and it involves using a mantra and mantra most people are familiar with to some degree mantra there's a few ways that you can um, translate this word one of them is that man comes from the word manas which means mind and second part of the word tra roughly translates as the english word vehicle and it's where we get our English words as well, tractor, transport, train, tram, the tra aspect. So that mantra is essentially a mind vehicle. Now, when you learn, as I said, we do this traditional ceremony to begin with, which is a ceremony of gratitude. You know, it's a way of saying thank you 
to where all this knowledge, wisdom and practice comes from, knowing that I didn't just make this up last week after, you know, some wonderful experience that I had, or mm-hmm. as you were saying, to make a few extra bucks, um, that this is something that has been passed down for generations through a lineage. And, you know, it really is such a blessing to learn something like this in your life. And that's the gratitude, you know, thank you again, thank you um, for meeting me where I'm at and, and to be able to receive something that's going to help you no longer suffer in this life, like ultimate gratitude. So we begin with that ceremony of gratitude and then each person receives their personal mantra, their mind vehicle. And it's this mind vehicle along with the technique, the effortless technique that we teach um, that allows you to move from that very active thought field surface layer awareness and like a mind vehicle, like any vehicle taking you from one place to another, this mind vehicle, this mantra draws the mind inwards and it allows the mind to move into subtler, quieter, more coherent layers of awareness until we actually transcend the mind altogether and we experience ourselves as an unbounded field of pure awareness. Now, when we experience that, it can feel very relaxing, very peaceful, very blissful. It's the ultimate. It's the ultimate where all things have come from and where all things will return. But when we do that, but we know that whatever the mind does, the body follows. So as the mind settles in, the body also moves inwards and the the body begins shifting into um, deeper states of parasympathetic, which is the opposite of the fight or flight state, our our state of relaxation. Now, the parasympathetic nervous system, um, it's also known as the resting and digesting response. And the resting part we're very familiar with. Yeah. That's when we let go and we're like, oh, this feels really nice. We go have a massage and we're like, oh, so relaxed. You know, we go to rest at night and we're like, oh, finally I can let go. Um, these are other times that we may activate parasympathetic. But what we've also probably experienced when we've had a massage or tried to go to sleep at night or sat down to meditate is that your body will relax, but then almost immediately after you notice that your mind starts kicking into overdrive and you're just thinking and thinking and thinking. Have you ever gone to have a massage and you're like, oh, this is going to be so relaxing. And then you end up (laughs) just lying there on the table thinking about, you know, it can be very creative thinking, um, but you end up lying there just thinking the whole time and you're like, shh, let go. I meant to be relaxing here. (laughs) Um, And same when you want to go to sleep at night, right? Mm. So this is actually indicating to us that when we shift into a state of resting, it's not just about relaxation. It's actually about creating the perfect conditions to be able to process and digest the buildup of stress, overwhelm, fatigue, past memories and experiences that are actually preventing us from living the fullness of who and what we are as our 24-7 reality. And so when we shift into that healing state, because it's really what parasympathetic activation is. It's a healing, a repairing, a regenerating. Um, There's the rest and relaxation side. And then there's also the very active, dynamic, uh, healing, letting go, digesting. And how that usually plays out is a lot of activity in the nervous system, which influences the mind. And that's how we start thinking. So in this practice of meditation, with Vedic meditation, um, we really are working with the natural tendencies of the mind-body. We're not resisting, we're not rejecting, we're not trying or controlling, we're working with, which is why people feel like it's a very kind, compassionate, inclusive meditation technique. Um, And so one of those things that we include are thoughts, Thoughts are a part of meditation (laughs) and anyone's listening who has learned um, will laugh because they're like, oh yeah, it is. It very, very much is. And interestingly enough, when you allow that natural process to take place, you experience greater depth. 
you come out of your meditation, you experience greater clarity, greater presence, and you're not controlling. So much of this practice is teaching us how to not control life, how to go with the natural flow of the intelligence of our mind bodies, of the intelligence of nature. We need to stop resisting. Life is very much supporting us at all times. All life's wanting is for us to evolve and to experience the fullness of whom what we are in every moment. It's really what life is intending for us. And when we resist that, that's when we suffer. That's when we start to notice pain in the body, disruption in the mind, you know, in, in family life, in community life, disturbance in relationships, going all the way up to the global level. So we really need to stop resisting evolution, which is, in, which means we really need to start embracing change. And we have been taught almost the complete opposite. <laughs> control your way to happiness. Mm. And I think by now we have all done enough you know, experiential research in that field to know it doesn't work. You cannot control your way to happiness. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, this, this approach to, to Vedic meditation seems really freeing. Yeah. Like taking the, the dogma out of meditation, which I think prevents mm. a lot of people from stepping into meditation. Yeah. And how we practice, like you're saying, the technique itself is actually how we practice the technique itself is such a beautiful way to practice life. And you notice there's just this natural flow on effect. Everything we do is quite deep, quite subtle, quite transcendental, um, a lot in the subconscious. And as we start working on those deeper levels, it bubbles up or prints out into the way that we're thinking and feeling and behaving. So there's a lot of what someone might call spontaneous change that takes place. Um, like I say, start meditating. You don't have to change. If you if you struggle with sleep, don't touch your sleep. We don't have to do anything about the sleep. What we're going to do is work on the root cause of why you can't sleep, which is the state of your nervous system and limited conscious awareness. So let's work on that in meditation and let's see what happens. And people notice shifts and changes in every aspect of their life, but they haven't even touched that thing. They haven't had to work on the relationship or work on the sleep or work on this. Now, having said that, yes, we still probably need eyes open, conscious <laughs> um, consideration and understanding and maybe work on some things too. Meditation's mm -hmm. not the silver bullet. I never present it as that. You can't just start meditating and not do anything else. However, there is this phenomenon of a change that happens from the inside out without you as the individual um, having to instigate it because it's you as the universal self that's actually emerging from inside and re-inhabiting who you are. I think as well that all just comes back to this essence of deep reverence and that mm. continued slowing down mm. um and it, with that in mind and and a sort of imagining you know you're talking about this ceremony uh that you do which i assume is is like a type of puja um mm. it, it really takes my mind into or back to lineage and i just mm. love to know a little bit about if you can share with a listener the lineage of Vedic meditation in terms of teachers and, and perhaps if you'd like to share a little bit about Pandachi and your relationship with him mm. and your, your current teachers and your experience of going back to India, wherever that, wherever that takes you. Mm, beautiful. Yes, yeah, so you, you used the word puja, which is the Sanskrit word for what we would say, what we would call ceremony. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. Puja... One way um, one of my teachers describes puja or translates puja is pu comes from pushpam, which means mm -hmm. flower, and ja means to do. So puja is to do with flowers. So we can look at that on the surface level and kind of be like, okay, I can see that. We're offering flowers um, as, a, as a way of saying thank you. But ultimately, 
what the flower that we're offering is, is actually our own heart. So this is the opening of the heart. This is the gratitude. This is why we say it's a ceremony of gratitude. And to do with the flower actually means to do with your own heart. And that's the connection piece there. And this is why pudra ceremony um, is so powerful. Mm. So um, the tradition from which um, we teach is known as the Shankaracharya lineage. And um, the way in which it has come down to us in the West is actually through a man who wasn't ordained in the order, um, but became a way that allowed this knowledge, wisdom, and practice to be translated from India to the West. And that man is Maharishi Mahesh Yogi. And Maharishi was devoted to his teacher, who he would call his master, which was Gurudev, what he he would refer to it as Gurudev. It's a um, a sign of devotion, uh, a way of describing so my Gurudev. Um, his name was Swami Brahmananda Saraswati, and Swami Brahmananda Saraswati was the last undisputed um, leader of the Vedic knowledge in India. He was on the seat of the northern. Uh, he sat in the northern seat of the Shankaracharya order, um, which is known as the seat of the heart, the seat of devotion. And the one who sits in the north is also the head of the whole um, of spirituality in India, of Sanatana Dharma, known as Sanatana Dharma. And um, he he was the last undisputed one. Since then, there have been more because it's lineage and passed down. Mm-hmm. Um but we won't go into the politics of spirituality <laughs> today. <laughs> so um, you spoke about Pandaji. Pandaji is a dear friend and one of my teachers as well. He grew up with Maharishi Mahesh Yogi. So it was Swami Brahmananda Saraswati who, going back before Swami Brahmananda, so many great masters and teachers. Some, if you've studied yoga, you may know of Adi Shankara, uh, of Veda Vyasa the one who wrote down and sequenced the Veda that we have today to be able to read. Um, many other, Vasishta, you might have read the book Yoga Vasishta. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, so many incredible masters going all the way back in time. Um, but coming this way towards us, uh, Pandaji, as we refer to him, his name is actually Pandit Bhaskaran, uh, he grew up with Maharishi. Well, maybe we should say, Instead of growing up, at age eight, yeah, he went to the ashram in Rishikesh where Maharishi Mahesh Yogi was starting to teach this and people were coming from all over India but also from the West because he was traveling globally. Um, Pandaji learnt from Maharishi to be um, a pundit, hence why his name is Panditji. Um, so he studied the Veda um, and he's an expert in Sama Veda, one one part of the Veda, of the four Vedas. And he trained in all the Vedic ceremony, in puja, in what's known as yagya, which is a fire ceremony that he is a master in. And if you get to experience yagya with Pandaji, sorry, I know this is a lot of Sanskrit. If you're like, what is she, <laughs> what is she even saying? What is going on? Um, to experience fire ceremony, mm. you know, with Pandaji is very, very powerful. Mm-hmm. So he grew up um, from age eight and then trained to be a teacher, has been meditating since age eight. And his story, I actually had him on the on our podcast, which I'm sure you've listened to. Mm-hmm, his story yeah. is yeah, really, really beautiful as well. Um, and he's probably the most prolific Vedic meditation teacher um, who uh, he's taught over 100,000 people the technique um, in India. Uh, in Chennai, and that's personally taught. Like this isn't online or anything like that, or a recorded version. This is all in person. So, you know what you can do in India <clears throat> is pretty incredible. The scale that you can go to, and you know, he's really an embodiment of everything that we teach: you know, bliss consciousness, of complete acceptance, of living in harmony with nature. 
of being so intuitive. You know, anytime I think of him, I'll look down and there's a WhatsApp. You know, he is also WhatsApping a lot of people <laughs> on any given day, you know, always wanting to share the love. But um, yeah, it's really beautiful to have someone have someone in your life who has, you know, devoted themselves to it and is such a an innocent and um just natural expression mm-hmm. of it all. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. He definitely seems like he's got this personified joy and sweetness. He just like yeah. radiates this level of ojas and tejas and he's just yeah, like there's all this light. It's light, exactly, mm. exactly. And that's come from his practice. Mm-hmm. That's come from his the devotion to chanting mantra, to doing ceremony, to, you know, listening to the Vedic knowledge and wisdom, and then teaching and being of service and giving all of this unconditionally to anyone who wants to come and learn. And that's how you do it, I guess. <laughs> and you're bringing him out to Australia next year. He, yes, he's coming out for his first Australian tour and that'll be in February 2024. So he'll be uh, touring with Wonderlust. We'll both be uh, guiding the meditation. That's um, part of the Wonderlust event, which will be wonderful. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then we are in Melbourne, Sydney, Perth, Adelaide, Noosa and Byron, and there'll be chances for you to experience Yagya, Vedic fire ceremony with him. There'll be some group meditations um, if you're a Vedic meditator that you can come along to, um, and some other community fire ceremony events as well. Do you know if there will be a Sydney Yagya? Because I noticed on the website there's no date there. Not for a community one, but Mm. there are private ones that we're doing. So yes. Yes, so there'll be small group ones rather than a big one. Mm-hmm. We've only got a short time in Sydney. Um, it was meant to be longer, but Wanderlust has us flying in and flying out, so we've got to just take what we can in those days in between. Express visit. Yes, yes. So I'd love to hear, on the note, we've very lightly alluded to a touched on India in conversation, mm-hmm. and I absolutely love seeing yours and many other people's updates when they're when they're there oh, photos mm-hmm. and and whatnot just living vicariously through other people especially in a post-covid world yes, yes. feels like an eternity since i've been back personally um but i'd love to know i'm just curious uh can you reflect upon any you know maybe one or two uh memories or experiences you have in india whether it's related to this conversation meditation etc or if it's completely you know a, just a different experience, a temple experience. But yeah, mm. I, I love hearing people's stories and something really special and memorable that you that you cherish. Gosh, that's hard. <laughs> I've been going. To, I've been going to India. I first went to India in 2011 on a meditation retreat. Um, so my first experience was very much a deep dive into the spiritual culture and tradition um, and and direct experience as well, actually, through practice. We were meditating yoga asana, pranayama meditation um, for hours, hours at a time. I don't think I really knew what I was signing up for. It was just like this feeling in my heart that was like, you have to do this. Like there was no other, no other way. Um, and so that first experience really opened my eyes up to the power of India, the energy of the place um, that is constantly renewed, constantly invoked through the amount of mantra chanting, ceremony, offerings, devotion, the bhakti, you know, that exists there, the, the singing every single night. We were in Rishikesh. So every single night I was like, what is this, you know, I was living in New York at the time. And so going from New York to India, I was like, wow. Um, So that was an incredible, my first experience was a very, it was an awakening for me, the only way I could describe it. And I felt it very much in my body, very much the Kundalini Shakti awakening and vibrating and actually creating a lot of pain in my body as well as the energy um, was clearing out 
the physical stress in Ayurveda, what we call the ama, the AMA, ama, the toxic builder of undigested life experiences or what we call stress. So it was a wild experience that first time that I went. It was absolutely incredible, overwhelming, so much going on. I was like, I can't wait to get home. And then I got home and then after that, life changed within about a month and I was back in Australia and the opportunity came up to train as a Vedic meditation teacher. And that's a whole other story. But that was my first experience of it. And it sounds like such an initiation. It was a huge initiation. <laughs> yes. But honestly, it feels like every time I go there, mm. there's an initiation mm-hmm, that takes mm-hmm. place. And yeah. it's like, oh, you're back. Are you? Wonderful. Okay. Now it's time for <laughs> the next level. And, you know, one 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 journey that I do remember was meeting um, who I call one of my teachers now, Sri Shakti Amma. And I was going from Rishikesh um, down to where Amma resides and has a temple and ashram. A temple. Yeah, in the south of India, in a near a small town called Velo, which is a few hours west of Chennai. So I left Rishikesh. And I was feeling amazing in Rishikesh, couldn't wait to get there. And then I went Rishikesh, Delhi. And as I got to Delhi, I started to feel I'm a little bit tired. I'm feeling a little bit kind of off. I had a little layover in Delhi before I jumped on my plane to catch that down to Chennai. And the closer I got to Amma's place, to the Golden Temple, I started to feel progressively worse and worse and worse until I got off the plane in Chennai. And there was a driver waiting to pick me up to take me there. And I remember getting in the car and just feeling like I have got something seriously wrong with me. I was freezing cold and it's Chennai in Mm -hmm. April, which is very warm. Like (laughs) you should be sweating. Yeah. (laughs) I was so cold. So I'd had like wrapped myself up in my pashmina and whatever other things that I had in my summer wardrobe. And I was shivering, shaking, I had a headache and I was just like, oh God, I'm really sick. And it's about a two and a half hour, three hour drive to the ashram. I got there and then I remember seeing this big group that was also their first time coming on retreat. And one of my friends, Ido from Ido and Joe was there playing some music. And I was like, I can't even, like, I can't even interact with anyone. And I just went straight into my room at the ashram and I thought I'm going to be terribly ill. And I went to sleep and probably, I don't know, eight o'clock, something like that. And that night just had the most wildest dreams. And at one point, I think I woke up, but I could actually still be asleep. And I looked down at my body and I was covered in red dots, my whole entire body. And I was like, oh no, like, and I'm by myself, I'm traveling by myself in India. And I was just like, what is going on? And I think I was just so tired and so delirious. I was just like, I don't even care anymore. And I just went back, went back to sleep. I woke up 16 hours later, (laughs) everything had gone. The, the, The fever, the chills, the shaking, the everything was all gone. And I felt so bright and so alive and so full of energy. And I opened my door and I saw this big group that was there. They're all doing energy healings on each other. And I was like, where am I? It was like I'd stepped into Harry Potter's world or something like that. And I loved Harry Potter, so I was totally <laughs> into it. Um, and then I was only there for four days. And those four days were so powerful, so transformative. I met Amma, Sri Shakti Amma, who is an avatar of the Divine Mother of Narayani. So it was really beautiful after being part of a a lineage that has been traditionally more males taking on the role of teacher, of guru. Um, And so it was really nice to be in this ashram that was all about the Divine Mother, even though Sri Shakti Yama is a male's body. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. (laughs) This is a very interesting thing. I'm not sure. Yeah, how your listeners, how your listeners are with all of this, but <laughs> I understand though. I've been and I, I yes, yeah. I understand. 
So, you know, that beautiful divine feminine, although it's sitting in a masculine body, is very mm. much still mother. If, when you look at Sri Shakti Yama, mm. it's all very mm-hmm. mother. So to be introduced to that, and I really knew in my own self that I needed to um, re-enliven that femininity within me because the role of a teacher, especially in a masculine tradition, um, you know, you can really sit in a more masculine dominant energy in yourself. And I was recognizing, especially, you know, in relationships, romantic relationships, that having that more feminine influence was really important. So that ended up becoming a place that I have visited every year, many times a year since then, um, and has become what I call my home, my second Mm -hmm. home. So highly recommend going there. It's such a wonderful way to experience India, the real traditional spiritual India, to go to ceremony, um, to do seva, to do selfless service with all the incredible projects that are there. And it's really, um, it's such a beautiful place to see how your personal practice is actually there to help you serve our world to help you serve all the beings that are actually part of our world, you know, not just me and my world that I benefit from practicing meditation and yoga, but it's actually there to go and serve. So that, that real, um, it's so alive there, as I'm sure you've experienced. It's so, uh, it just is. The only way I could describe it, it just is. It's just what people do. It's normal, you know. So anyway, the the beauty about being in India and having these incredible experiences is that there's something so sacred about these experiences that you cannot articulate them. In, mm. I was going to mm. say articulate them in the English language, but <laughs> language aside, like they're very very challenging to articulate. And even if you can find the words, it, it's hard to bring the essence through because it's something that's so felt rather than intellectualized. It's kind of like when you try to tell someone your dream and like it made complete sense to you when you were in it and then you try to tell someone about what happened and they kind of look at you and they're like, oh, yeah, like, cool, sounds great. <laughs> but so much <laughs> of the the depth and the richness and the the felt experience can't necessarily be communicated. It's why I, you know, have written poetry my whole life um, with the experiences that I've had because I have felt that poetry is able to communicate a more richer um, felt experience for people. Um, And and it just feels, I don't know, more whole, more whole. Mm, I love that. Mm. And and with your, uh, let's say, embracing of this more feminine approach Mm. or the qualities through your life and your work, and, and with all your knowledge and experience and experience in India directly as well, in your personal life, what, and I know that this is sort of endorsing compartmentalizing things, but what other aspects of these wisdom tradition, traditions do you really embrace, like in terms of yoga or Ayurveda or Jyotish or like on a personal mm-hmm. level, what, what what's what's something that you really have integrated and really strongly mm. believe in and weave through daily life? Ayurveda, most definitely, is something um, that Ayurveda is just living in harmony with nature. Like we give it this name, Ayurveda, but all indigenous peoples and cultures are living Ayurveda. Ayurveda is self-knowledge. Right? You can study Ayurveda by studying the self. And we are all able to do that because we're all here, you know, in these bodies that are comprised of the five elements that exist within the greater body of, of the universe that's also comprised of the five elements. So, you know, when I was experiencing a lot of health issues, mental, physical health issues um, in my early 20s, tw- late teens, early 20s, um, Ayurveda became something that I again, just fell in love with that aspect of the Vedic knowledge that felt very practical, 
It was like, this is what you can do every day <laughs> to align yourself with the rhythms of nature. And therefore, because it's like, why, why do I want to align myself with the rhythms of nature? Well, nature has infinite power and intelligence. Yeah. Shakti and consciousness is there. And if we want to have more of that within ourselves, then if we can align our own individual self, which is not separate, as you were saying, it's not separate from our universal self. But if these two, we can start merging, then we actually get supported by that power and consciousness of nature. So we feel there's more energy in our bodies. We feel there's more intuition. Or maybe that's the wrong word. There's greater intelligence within mm. and we become more intuitive. You know, we become more capable of detecting, okay, what's happening right now? What's needed? What's the next move for me? And it becomes natural and spontaneous. So this alignment with the rhythms and cycles of nature allows you to just have a, a smoother, more enjoyable journey in your human life. And that's really what Ayurveda is about. Ayurveda can seem quite dogmatic, rule-based, very intense to study. And if you're going to become an Ayurvedic doctor, a Vaidya, then yes, it, it, it's a lifetime's worth of study for that. Um, but in your own self living Ayurveda, um, it can be quite simple. And so Ayurveda definitely is something that has helped me align myself with the rhythms of nature and given me little practices, ways um, of being in the world and understanding how I can also navigate um, when there is some sort of challenge or some sort of disturbance or imbalance, I can actually use the principles of Ayurveda to understand and work out what's needed rather than having to always outsource to, you know, Google another human being, <laughs> books, podcasts, whatever. It really brings you back into the the intelligence and the energy that resides in your own body as very much a refinement of awareness you know fundamental yeah. awareness at all times yeah and i think that the, the the practices and the the structure and the steps are helpful on some level especially when we're new to yes. ayurveda in yes. realigning us and then it becomes something that oh, it's a very cliche word these days but very embodied you start mm. to it starts to become mm. a lived a real undertone this awareness becomes mm. the undertone for the way that you live everyday mm. life in terms of the decisions you make and how you choose to <laughs> relate to the world and everyone around you I mean, I can still smell the sesame oil that I had on my body this morning when I did a beautiful self-massage when I first wake, woke up and I went for a walk through our garden and picked some vegetables that were ready to go for the day and did some yoga asana, moved the body, had a shower, sat down and meditated. So yeah, it's it's something that can be integrated into your life and you know, this meditation, yoga, you know, mantra, self-massage, all of that, we really need to start getting it off the the to-do list, the checking box, you know, okay, great, done that, great, done that, great, mm, tick, tick, precisely. tick. And really bringing it more into like a practice of self-love and connection and you know, a joy, like it should be a joy to Pleasure. do. Pleasure, yeah. Yeah, yeah, because I feel so accomplished in the morning. Like if I do my my morning routine, and hey, I don't have kids now, so I totally understand if you're <laughs> like, there is no way I'm getting a massage in before 7 a.m. <laughs> yes, but, kids definitely, young young kids definitely young kids. throw that out, out the window sometimes, yes. but Having said that, you do it together. Yeah. I know so many people who are- With their babies and- Yeah, yeah, yeah devoted to their, to their mm -hmm. practices. Um, but it's a lifestyle. As you said, it's something that you love and enjoy. And I was meditating and I was feeling the after effect of having done the massage and the yoga and the breath work, but especially on my skin. And I could still feel the effect of it. And then at one point I just dropped in my meditation and I was just like, oh, this is why we do this. Mm -hmm. So 
it has an effect. Like everything we do has an effect. Mm. And when we can start, you know, having these, we call them techniques or practices, but just ways of being, you know, that really support um, good health, good mind, you know, happiness, good relationships. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So worth it. Yeah, and regard it's it's a change in paradigm from thinking about trying to eliminate or eradicate disease or imbalance, which of course Ayurveda definitely addresses that, but it's about mm-hmm. just bringing beauty into and reverence into daily life, um, yeah. which is so energizing and can give, give us strength even if life can or is it's stressful. Just, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So really bringing all this together, one of my favorite things that I love to ask guests on the podcast maybe it's a little selfish but I'm sure it serves everybody Uh, and I'd love to know you know maybe a couple of books one two three whatever comes through for you that um, Mm -hmm. you would really recommend maybe that have been pivotal for you or that pertain to our conversation Mm. yeah as you can see my gigantic bookshelf bookshelf that's (laughs) sitting behind me here I might have to turn around and have a little look at one point probably the first one that's coming to mind is one that I read, um, I think it was either just as I'd learned to meditate. I remember having it in New York in my bag, catching a subway to work, and I would just pull it out and just read one page a day. And that book is the Tao Te Ching by Lao Tzu. And I love the translation by Stephen Mitchell. Uh, Now, although Lao Tzu is said to be from China. A lot of people actually claim him as Indian and that he (laughs) had studied the Vedic knowledge and wisdom. And and when you read, um, when you read his, I'm not sure what you'd call it, poetry. In many ways it's poetry, but it's just, it's pure wisdom. They're short, very, very short, sometimes four or five lines, sometimes a bit longer. It just makes so much sense. And it's very deep and yet so practical. And so I'd just read one and then that would become like the theme for the day that I would feel into and contemplate and and see how it could be lived. So, And you can get it in a little pocketbook version, a little tiny thing that you can just slip into your bag. So the Tao Te Ching, definitely. Mm-hmm. Um, now I have to turn around and have a look. <laughs> <laughs> um I guess one of the, you know, uh, prime books of of the Vedic literature um, is the Bhagavad Gita. And the Bhagavad Gita sits within a larger book Mm -hmm. known as the Mahabharata. And the Mahabharata, uh, the translation I love, is by Ramesh Menon. All of his translations, transliterations, I should say, they're Mm -hmm. transliterations written in prose for the Western mind. Uh, they're incredible. They're the best storybooks you'll ever read. If you loved Harry Potter as a kid, you know, kind of Lord of the Rings, Star Wars, like all the mm-hmm, big, mm-hmm. the big epics. epics. Yeah. yeah, this is the biggest, greatest epic <laughs> you'll ever read. It might take you two years to get through. Mm-hmm. Um, there's quite a bit of Sanskrit, Sanskrit names in there, which you've got to get used to. But if you can just allow it to come in, reading that book transforms you from the inside out it's not even a book it's it's known as the fifth veda so it's all the knowledge of the veda into a story in very practical practical form Um, so the mahabharata and one of the key chapters of that is the bhagavad gita and um, i love maharishi's commentary maharishi mahesh yogi's commentary on the bhagavad gita because he brings it all back to the practice of vedic meditation and um, of transcending and it's very powerful when you see it in that light and you see oh this this Bhagavad Gita this story it's playing out inside me all of it's playing out inside Mm -hmm, of me mm -hmm. you know I have a war going on inside of me Mm -hmm. I have the light and the dark Um, so those two which is actually one We've actually had, um, so previous guest on the podcast recommended the Ramayana, but with a specific transliteration by Ramesh. Yes. So 
highly recommend the Ramayana as mm. well. That's also fantastic. And some other books that I actually read very early on in my meditation journey and then rediscovered again um, maybe about five years ago are the books called The Ringing Cedars um, by Vladimir Migre, I believe his last name, a Russian author. Um, they're known as the Anastasia books. I'm not sure right. if you've heard of them. I have. Yeah, that's familiar. They may actually be out of print at the moment. Um, you can find them on eBay or you can find them, I think, as a PDF download, even though it's recommended to read in book format so you're not connected to technology, electricity, mm. so it can actually come in. Um, but There's, you discover. I was just going to say that there is a great website that I buy secondhand books from and it's called mm. thrift books mm. i've got a lot of old editions or out of print texts from india and you know wow. and so forth and it's it's great because you can have a little favorites list even if they don't have something in stock they've got everything listed there and then you get pinged with an alert if some if something comes in and yeah it's the best the old versions are the best by the way the old versions of all of these books are great um but these Anastasia books, you find out there's nine of them. Uh, you find out at some point that she's from Russian Vedic origins. And she refers wow. to herself as Vedrus, Vedrus. And she speaks more about the nature aspect. She's an awakened, enlightened, we would call Siddha, you know, uh, being that resides in the, um, in the Russian forest in the Siberian jungles. Um, and these books are just amazing, quite Russian at times. So you've got to, you've got to be feel into that, mm. but she teaches you everything of how to plant seeds so that the fruit and vegetables that come from that plant actually has your DNA encoded into it. And the plant will produce specific fruits and vegetables for your ailments, for your condition, so wow. that your garden actually ends up healing you. And, you know, everything she talks about is in, you know, biodynamic gardening. It's in the work of Rudolf Steiner. It's in the Veda. It's it's all there. So they're fascinating books. I love them. She speaks a lot about um, fertility and conception the Russian Vedic worldview of conception, birth, and parenting, of marriage. So, yeah, it's it sounds incredible. Yeah, they're very, I love those books as well. Mm. They'll be books I'll have for the rest of my life. So. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you for sharing that. I'll um, pop everything in the show notes anyway. So, it makes it really mm -hmm. easy for those listening to just have a little quick and quick look and, yeah, and check them out. So, thank you. Mm, so, welcome. Laura, um, I'd love to know before we close if you could share with the listener what you have coming up you know we're rounding out 2023 mm. um what's coming up for you over the next uh, few months uh in mm. terms of trainings retreats events etc yeah so when we teach vedic meditation it is taught in person so you do have to find a teacher that is somewhere in your area or is traveling to your area and i tend to do a bit of both so i teach in noosa i live in noosa at the moment so i teach monthly in noosa and also do private courses here. So if you're coming up to Noosa, a lot of people love coming for holiday time to either escape Melbourne or Sydney or Canberra and <laughs> um, come for a nice little break. So I also teach private courses and courses for families. So if you come up and you're like, let's all do this together, cool. let's get the kids kids meditating as well. We do a lovely family course um, and the course is four sessions over four days. So you just need to come up for four days in total. So I teach in Noosa. Um, I'm also about to go and teach on a retreat in Byron Bay. So that'll be at the retreat center known as Waibalina Organic Farm. And that's for uh, a human design retreat with my um, dear friend and other Vedic meditator, um, Hilary McVeigh. So I'll be teaching in Byron. If you're in Byron Bay and want to learn, uh, you're also welcome to come along. You don't have to do the retreat, although if you want to, you're welcome. Um, but you can also just come along for the Vedic meditation part of the retreat. And I like to say this as well, like if you have, if you're hosting a retreat, if you teach yoga or if you do breath work or if you're doing a women's retreat, whatever it is, and, you know, you want me to come along and share Vedic meditation on the retreat, that is something that I do as well. And it's really nice to 
to have that as an addition. Um, and it's only about an hour and a half, two hours yeah. a day of yeah. learning. And then people walk away with a practice for life. Mm-hmm. Um, so I've got that one. And then heading to Melbourne. Melbourne is somewhere that uh, I teach regularly as I used to live there for about eight years. And that's really where the the main community of our Mahasoma Meditation Collective resides um, is in Melbourne. So I'm there every few months as well, teaching in Melbourne. Uh, and then also going to be in Sydney. I'll be in Sydney for the first time in a little bit. Uh, my mum lives in Sydney and Sydney was where I first, where I was born, where I first started teaching. So it feels really nice to be, to be heading back there. Uh, and then obviously Pandaji's tour in February, which we'll put the link in the show notes if anyone wants to connect with that or come see us at Wonderlust. Mm-hmm. Come have a Vedic fire ceremony experience. Um, super powerful. That'd be incredible. Yes. Mm. And so for anyone listening, if they have not learned Vedic meditation and they would like to do that with you, uh, gen- I mean, I'm sure everybody teaches and sets things up a little bit differently, but generally how many people do you have in a group like per training? Yeah, it really depends where I'm teaching. So okay. anywhere from like three to 20 people, mm-hmm. um, depending who signs up. And then, yeah. and obviously you then have ongoing support. There's this community yeah. and ongoing uh, group meditations. So it's not like you do the training and then off you go and that that's it. See you I later. Don't, I, don't to, yeah. <laughs> I don't know if you want to speak to that a little bit. Yeah, it's probably one of the um, most wonderful things that gets offered is this lifetime support. So once you learn, you can actually come and redo the course again for free anytime you like for the rest of your life. So I have people reset the course, whether they're not meditating and need to get back into it, or they are meditating and just simply want to sit in and hear it all again and have a deeper, richer experience. So that's always on offer. Uh, You know, I just want you meditating, like whatever I can do to support you in meditating every day. Beautiful. I'm there. So we have the resetting of the course. Once you've learnt, you also have access to our free weekly group meditation and Vedic wisdom sessions. They're both online and in person. Um, and that's a really great way to connect with a community of meditators, um, to meditate together and have that ex- shared experience in the collective consciousness, and also to be able to ask questions. And questions at group med are technical, practical. They also can go quite deep um, into understanding the Vedic worldview on different things of birth, of death, of grief of whatever it may be that someone is going through. Um, So that's there. And we also have email contact. So I stay in touch with you and send weekly emails if that's your thing. Some people don't don't want to have any more emails coming into their account. They just want to meditate. And I'm like, that's totally fine. But you choose the degree to which you want to engage. That's what support's there for, right? And when you need it, you grab it. And if you don't need it, you let it go. So that's the way that we offer Um, our lifetime, what we call our lifetime membership. And then once you've learned, there are also a whole lot of advanced trainings that we do. So if you want to take a deeper dive into the Vedic knowledge, for example, next year, um, we are beginning our next cohort of what we call Rishi training. And Rishi is a Sanskrit word that means a seer, S-E-E-R, a seer of reality. And what we teach in this training, oh gosh, it's, it's, so vast and we share all the Vedic knowledge to help you really fully live um, what it is that you're tapping into and experiencing in your meditation. It's like we flesh the whole thing out and we work on everything from relationships to um, self awakening, self understanding to gosh, I'm trying to bring my, (laughs) bring my brain to, to what's in there. It's huge. It's huge. And it's incredible. And it finishes with a two-week pilgrimage um, in India to the sacred sites of our tradition. So it's a really incredible advanced program that we teach. We run retreats in India, in Bali, uh, locally. So there's a lot more to to engage in once you've learned the practice as well. Mm -hmm. And so for anyone listening, if they're interested in learning more, are all the events and so forth are they going to the Mahasoma website or are they going to your website, laurapool.com? Um, 
It can be both. It can okay. be both. So a lot of the stuff that we run um, as a collective, such as Rishi training mm -hmm. and our other advanced programs and retreats, that will all be on the Mahasoma website. Just my personal teaching and courses are on my website mm -hmm. and all of the stuff for Pandaji's tour because we're bringing him out through Mahasoma mm -hmm. is all on the Mahasoma website. And Mahasoma, for some of you, they're like, what is this? Um, it's a, a feminine-led collective of Vedic meditation teachers and we work together um, to offer to our community, you know, support, advanced trainings, connection and to just keep teaching together, keep sharing more together. So that's Mahasoma. Mahasoma, uh, Maha means great and Soma means the flow of consciousness. Mm. So Mahasoma, we're all about that great flow of consciousness. So good. So good. Yeah. <laughs> well, Laura, I'm so grateful we could have this conversation together. <laughs> and, you know, it, it's these conversations are really so much uh, nectar for me personally and certainly for the listeners as well and that we could invite the listener into not only insight around Vedic meditation but also through your lens specifically into your, mm. your work and your path. Um, so I really appreciate everything that you shared and, and for your time today. Thank you so oh, much. Thank you. It's been so much fun. I can see the the wakefulness in you and like <laughs> the questions and the, you know, like the engagement, like we've been sitting here on Zoom doing this mm -hmm. um, and it's just been wonderful. It's so nice when you connect with someone who, you know, is having a similar experience and we're just like, yes, this is amazing. Mm -hmm, so, mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And if anyone is a Vedic meditator, already and lives up here in the area because I'm relatively new it's only been a couple years um, please reach out because if you've learned with any other Vedic meditation teacher you are more than welcome to come and join our weekly group meditation um, and wisdom sessions and all the other things that we're offering here so please just reach out just send me an email would love to have you part of part of the community here perfect I'll pop them mm. um, all the links to to connect with you in the in the show notes of course so wonderful if this episode was of value to you and your life, please subscribe. And if you can think of someone who would benefit from this dialogue, please do them a favor and send it their way. If you feel called, hop on over to iTunes and leave a five-star review. This is the best way to get these conversations into the ears and hearts of our wider community, to those who need it most. You can find me at amyelandry.com or over on Instagram at amyelandry. May we all move a little closer to a life living in alignment.